All right, you guys. So today is orientation. The folders I gave you is pretty much going to be everything that I'm going to say, not necessarily verbatim, but you know, I can't remember everything. So I have my little guide here to help walk me through everything. What I'm going to do is I'm going to explain what Bark University is. We're going to talk about the orientation. And a lot of this is to help decide where we should place you, if classes are great for you, if maybe we should do privates, so on and so forth. That's kind of what the orientation is here to do. So it's okay if we come in here knowing absolutely nothing. It's okay if we've done a CGC already. It's just to figure out where we're at and what we want to do moving forward. So the big goal here of Bark University our classes lead into the K-9 Good Citizen Certification, the CGC, recognized by the AKC, the American Kennel Club. The CGC is a certification that you can get for your dog. It looks really good on paper. A lot of um, apartments now are taking the CGC as okay for breed-restricted dogs. A lot of insurance is requiring dogs to have CGC if you have a high-risk breed. We don't like to call anyone a high-risk breed, but an insurance company sure do. So not that anyone here is a high-risk breed, not even you, Miss Honey. But still, this is some of the reasons to get it. And other things is it's kind of a base-level certification for knowledge of your dog. It's just like to make sure that your dog can do those things that we would expect a good dog to be able to do. Now, CGC isn't for everyone, and not everyone's going to pass the CGC. That's okay. It's a baseline. It's fine if we can't do it, but it does give us a good thing to strive towards. So, with Bark University, we're a really unique way of taking classes. You may have taken classes in the past with some of your other dogs. You may have done it with your friends or parents growing up. So we do it a little bit different here. Here we have our different levels as we're going through it. So we teach the same thing over and over and over again in the first level in Fetchman. And then we do the same thing in Barkmore, and we do the same thing in Junior, over and over and over again until we're good at it. So if you come in one day, your dog's having an off day, we're not going to leave you in the dust by moving on the next week. So the next week, we may, most places, they cover, okay, well, now we're going to go over this. Now we're going to go over this. With us, it's the same thing every single week until your dog's good at it. And when they are, you're going to graduate up to the next one, and so on and so forth until you've got it. And by the end of, C of uh, Bark University, you should be able to have your CGC. We should be able to make where we need to be. <laughs> so um, when it comes to it, we're going to have our lesson plan. It's already in your folder of everything that we're going to learn in level one, level two, level three, leading up to it. And every time you guys come, I'm going to give you homework that's going to have everything listed out verbatim and step by step by step. Some of your dogs may be well into level three and pass CGC. Some of your dogs may want to start at level one. That's fine. But we're going to do it again and again until you got it, until your dog's got it. So you can miss a day. You can take vacation. You can skip a week. You can do those kind of things and still come back and not be left in the dust. That's kind of what our program is made for. So does anyone have any questions about Bark University? I know it's kind of complicated, but it's all right. I can explain it again if anyone's... Don't understand. Nope. All right, good. Okay, so let's talk about why we're here. Dog training, my favorite subject. All right, so first things first, let's talk about training and what it is and what it does. When it comes to dog training, a lot of people, they have this idea and this concept of, uh, I ask my dog to do something, they do it, I give them a reward. If we put it as simply as possible, sure, yeah, that's what kind of what it is. But we have to teach our dogs how to learn. Your dog needs to learn how to learn, and we have to, they have to know that we're asking them to do something. So that leads me into cueing, marking certain behaviors. When your dog does something right, telling them that your dog has done something correct. A lot of training centers use clickers. So a clicker is by far the most important thing that is in training, period. And I say that to say you don't need it, but you have to do what it does. You have to mark a behavior. So I'll give you an example. The very first time you taught your dog how to sit, because I imagine everyone in here knows how to sit, maybe with not 100% certainty every single time, but we got the concept. The very first time you asked your dog to sit, you took a treat in your hand and you held it in front of your dog's nose, and whether you pushed their butt down and you lured them until they sat, or however you got them to sit, 
you threw the biggest party as soon as they said, yes, good baby, oh my God, yes, good girl, and you gave them a treat. You think they did it for the treat. They did it because you marked and you got really, really excited about it. And the treat came afterwards. They're like, oh yeah, okay, now I know what they want. So the next time you said sit, they said, they got really excited when I put my butt on the floor and they're going to do it again. Every single time you're going, yes, good job, and they're going to get paid for it. You're going to get that reward every single time, right? They're going to start getting excited to do it because now they know exactly what they did. This is so important because timing is important. You've got to be able to mark exactly what you want your dog to do. So dogs don't have a finite amount of words they can learn. They can learn thousands of words. But for us right now, when we're talking gibberish to them, they don't really understand. So we're going to keep it simple. We're going to keep them short. So when we're talking with our dogs, for example, oh man, yes, I'm going to mark this behavior when he looks at me, right? Touch. Yes, marking a behavior when he touches my hand. I'm going to make sure we mark every time. I use yes as a simple cue. Now, with our dogs, when we want to teach them how to do anything, good girl is fine, good boy is fine, but I still want you to keep it simple and keep a marked term. We can charge this mark up with yes, reward, yes, reward. You can do it with something they already know. I like starting with sit because your dog already knows sit. Sit, yes, and reward. They need to understand that yes means they did something right and a reward is coming with it. So, he's like, oh my goodness. So, when we get started with our dogs, we'll use someone as an example. We'll just use Minnow here. Finite. Akio. Sit. Yes. Marking that behavior as soon as it happens. Arresto momentum. Yes. Good boy. My dog is trained in Harry Potter spells. I'm not summoning demons, I promise. Good boy. Touch. Alter. Yes. Good boy. Arresto momentum. Yes. So note how every single time he does what I ask him to do, I mark it immediately with yes. I want you to do the same thing with your dogs no matter what mundane task you're asking them to do so they start understanding yes is going to mean a cookie's coming. Because if I said, hand me that thingy mabobber behind you, you turn around behind you and you start gra grasping for things, you'll know I want it as soon as I say yes. This is how your dog's going to start understanding how to learn. Now, from there, let's talk about treats. Treats are incredibly important as well. Second most important things to clicker. Now, we've got to have treats to learn. You can eventually wean off of them and you won't need them every time but they do help a lot in the beginning because you got to get paid for what you're working for, right? So, when it comes to treats, there are three different values of treats. There's low value treats, medium value treats, and high value treats. I'm going to ask you all a question. Some of you in this room are going to give me different answers, and that's okay. If I put a snake in a bucket in the middle of this room, and I said, touch it, would you do it? No. What'd you do? Touch the snake. Yeah, okay. Will you touch the snake? You'll definitely touch the snake. You touch the snake? He'll touch the snake. Will you guys touch the snake? No, they're not going to touch the snake. All right. I will give you $100 to touch the snake. No. Okay. You guys already said you touch the snake. Gold retriever energy. I love it. I'll give you $10,000 to touch the snake. All right. We'll work for medium value treats. There are some people, they go, uh-uh, no, at $10,000. And I'm like, oh, you got big money, huh? When it comes to that, at some point, there's not a price you can't put on something, right? With dogs, now for me, touching the snake isn't hard. For you guys, touching the snake isn't hard, especially if you like snakes. If you don't like snakes, they're the worst. Now, if I said stick your hand in a bucket of cockroaches, would you do that? Mm-mm, no. $10,000, would you do it? I do like but I'm <laughs> sometimes right but she would have done it for ten thousand dollars let's face it she would have done it for ten thousand dollars you may still have stuck your arm in the bucket of cockroaches uh this is tracy she's a veterinarian so she'll do things that the rest of us really won't do so when it comes to that it's understanding that we find things more difficult than others for me for you sticking your hand in the bucket with a snake is not difficult 
for you it is. Cockroaches would be incredibly difficult because we're afraid of it. We're uncertain. We're scared. You have no reason to be afraid of the snake. It's not dangerous. You watch me put it in there, but you're still scared of it. Now imagine you asking your dog to do something they're scared of, and you don't understand why they're afraid of it. This is where reward comes in. We have to make it worth it to our dog to do this. So some people made me get a $10 million. That's a high value reward. And sometimes it's that hard to do something. It's not hard to convince someone to do something. So we want to keep that in mind when we're asking our dog to do a really difficult task. Sit is a very easy task. Low value reward. That's going to be kibble, crunchy biscuits, a little milk bone. That's a low value reward. Medium value are going to be soft training treats that are small. You can break into small pieces. And high value reward, the less the ingredient, the higher the value. Think boiled chicken. Hot dog in moderation, you know, things like that. Cheese in moderation. The lesser ingredient, the higher the value, and it's what your dog perceives as the highest value. I would recommend, like, jerky treats for high-value reward, something that your dog doesn't get a lot of and frequently. When we're asking our dog to do something, <laughs> it's really hard. Some things are hard for us to do all the time, okay? So <laughs> when it comes to those situations, we want to have a variety of those kinds of treats. Because when we want our dog to do something that's difficult, we might need to pull out a higher value reward. So easy, asking your dog to sit, they sit, they get a reward. Sometimes you don't have to give them a reward. You just go sit, good job. Asking your dog to walk past another dog loose leash and not bark at them, we might have to pull out a million dollars and go, hey, come on, so that they can start doing that, right? So understanding the different values of treats is where we start. So once you have your different values of treats and you're marking that behavior because you start walking by, Hey, let's go. They look at me. Yes, good job. And you're able to reward. You're able to mark what you want and pay them what, you're, what they're asking for, right? So that leads me into the next thing. Next part of training. Patience. Patience is arguably probably the most important part of training. Now, when learning anything, it's difficult. But I'm going to put it in simple terms. The very first time any of us learned how to drive, we sat in a parking lot behind the steering wheel of a car and stared at all those buttons and thought to myself, oh my God, I'm going to kill everyone and then myself. This is awful. Then we started to roll around and we slammed ourselves in the steering wheel four times, hitting the brake too hard. We've all done it. But we got better at it. But we had to practice. And we didn't start driving overnight on the highway. After a little while, we got comfortable with it. We started on neighborhood streets. Maybe we ran into a mailbox. Maybe some of us learned on a farm and ran into a fence post. Doesn't matter, right? It's fine. We did it in the farm truck. It's okay. Point is, we were bad at it and we got better. Then, when we were a little bit better, we started on city roads. Maybe 377, maybe 26 out here. And then maybe later on, when we were so certain and so sure, and we didn't live in Texas, we drove on the highway because it's scary on the highway and it's really hard to do. It takes time to work to get better at something. You don't wake up tomorrow and say, I'm going to be an Olympic gold medalist. And then boom, you're an Olympic gold medalist. You have to practice and work to it. You're not going to have a perfectly well-behaved dog in one training class, and maybe not in two or three or four, but with enough work, and enough patience, you can have a dog that you want. Set your expectations. If your expectations or what you have for your dog are set in stone, watch how closely you'll follow those expectations. I'm going to give you one more example of it too. Any of you that have kids know, and any of you that have been a child will know, that from the moment they are functioning, you're going, say please, say thank you, say excuse me. That thing has said, <laughs> that's all it said, but you're saying say please, say mama. You're starting to set expectations. Every time they go in the bathroom, when they're this tall to when they're this tall, did you wash your hands? Did you wash your hands? Did you wash your hands? Until eventually, you just start asking them what color the soap was. What color the soap? Did you brush your teeth? Every single time. Because this is the expectation you set. Now with kids, you're going to do it for 18, maybe longer, years. And with your parents did it for you for longer than that, Right? We would hope that there was a cutoff, and even still now we're married, some of us, and they still go, did you do this? And you go, no. And you still have to be reminded. Your dogs are the same way. 
They still have brains. They still get sidetracked. But setting that expectation for them, right? Everyone has it programmed into the tis, to this day. Any one of you will bump into a table and apologize to the table. It's programmed into you. This is an expectation your parents set for you. Say, I'm sorry. Say, excuse me. If we did this for our dogs, we wouldn't need dog training, would we? If we set that expectation and adhered to it the same way that we do our kids, sit for the door every single time. If I'm going to walk out of this room, I want my dog to still be on the bed. It's the expectation I've set. Now, with lots of training we've got there, if I walk over and pet a dog, I want my dog to remain on the bed. It's an expectation that I've set. Now, lots of training have gone into my dog. Lots of training. But if we set something that simple, I want my dog to not rush to the door every time I open the door, and I have my dog sit and wait for release cue every single time I open the door, you've set an expectation. And what's going to happen is, just like saying, say excuse me, they're going to start bumping the table and apologizing to the table. They're going to see the door open, and they're going to go, I can't go through it. There's no one here to tell me free. Set those expectations. Patience and setting expectations. Within reason, you are not going to teach your dog how to stand up on its hind legs and bake you a cake and bring it out to you. But you can set that expectation of, my dog's not going to rush the door. My dog's not going to jump on people. My dog's not going to do this. And the best way to do it is when we have that expectation is have a game plan. And that's where I come in to help you with the game plan. So, with that, let's talk about game plans. Number one, my number one rule, reward for the behavior you want. Number one, one of the big things that we do is when our dog is scared, when they're whining, when they're shaking, when they're at the vet office, when they're at Lowe's because we decided to take them and they're barking at someone in the basket, we go, shh, you're fine, it's okay. Who's okay? You're okay, you're fine. Don't do this. The reason why is because your dog doesn't understand that, but your dog does understand that it's being told, yes, good girl, act this way. They're getting rewarded. They're getting marked, yes, and they're getting told what my behavior is correct. The best thing that we want to do when this is happening is tell them what we want. Ah, uh -uh, leave it. If your dog doesn't know, leave it. Maybe we need to practice leave it. Don't worry, we're going to get to leave it. But ah, uh, leave it. Or you're not going to react at all. Almost callous disregard. Almost. We still, we care that our dog is upset, but they're not actively hurting, but we don't want to encourage this behavior by giving them attention for doing it. So if my dog is freaking out and panicking, I'm going to sit there, I'm going to wait. Let him work it out, or I'm going to give him some more space. We're going to walk away from whatever it is. But when my dog finally disengages and looks at me, I'm going to say, yes, good boy. Reality, I'm going to go, leave it, let's go. I've taught my dog what leave it means. Don't worry, we're going to get to that. But right now, we don't want to reward fear. So if our dog starts getting nervous, they start barking at someone, they start getting anxious, it's just Jimmy. You know Jimmy. It's fine. We don't want to do that. Leave it. Uh-uh, go lay down. That's enough. Stop. And if they don't know that, you're going to go take them. You're going to go put them somewhere where they don't have that problem right now. And we'll get there. We'll get there. Number two, the value of doing nothing. Reward for the behavior you want, right? Doing nothing. Doing nothing. Doing nothing. Doing nothing. And yet, we as humans wait for our dogs to make a mistake so that we can correct them. If your dog is doing everything you want them to do in this moment, reward them for doing that. You'll have a dog that'll chill out a lot faster and a lot more frequently because now they don't have to do something to get your attention. They don't have to demand bark at you. They don't have to paw at you. They don't have to... Be alert as everything's walking by because if I just lay here and I hung out, mom will eventually bring me a treat. Mom will give me a treat. So when we're in classes, and I'm, it's not going to be often I sit here and talk your ear off. It's an orientation, so it's different today. A lot of talking, a lot of me gabbing. But when we're just sitting here talking, I want you to reward your dog when they're doing absolutely nothing, when they're just hanging out, they're just relaxing, and especially reward them for check-ins. Check-ins are when your dog glances up at you and checks your face or looks in your eyes asking you for a direction. These are so important because your dog's going to make decisions because they're little sentient creatures that think, they understand, they make choices. They're not little robots that we program. They do make choices. But there's sometimes where, just like a little kid, walking up to something scary, your kid's going to go, 
And they're going to look at you to see if you're scared, you're nervous, or whatever. And if you're a mom, you fake it. Everything's great. Oh my gosh, it's fine. Jesus Christ. Right? We're going to fake it. When you were a kid, you still looked to whoever your guardian was to make sure that you're safe in the situation. Your dog does the same thing. And if they check and you're panicked and scared and freaking out, they're going to go, okay, <laughs> strap in, buckle up, let's go. They're going to be scared and nervous as well. Those check-ins are so important. When they look at you, they're watching, waiting for the next one. Like, what do you want me to do? Reward those. Even if you're just sitting there and your dog just looks at you, yes, reward. Asking you what to do next. In the end, let's say you have a reactive dog that barks at other dogs on a leash, right? Let's say Honey barks at another dog. What you'd really like is her to see another dog and go, I'm scared of it, and look at you. And you go, leave it. And she go, okay. Instead of her going, I'm scared. Bark, 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 bark. We want her to check herself and check back in with you. Check-ins are really important, and it's good to start with just them looking at you. Because when you can get your dog's eye contact, you can get their attention, they're going to be listening and waiting for the next thing. What should I do next? And it helps them feel more confident. Because let's face it, not everyone's cut out to be a manager. Some people want someone else to do it for them so they don't have to. And that is absolutely acceptable. 100%. There's sometimes I'm like, I don't want to call a doctor. You do it. So if someone else can take the reins, if you got in a car accident and you're upset and you're crying, you don't want someone to come over and give you a hug and tell you it's going to be okay. You want someone to come over and go, here's my keys. I got it. I'll talk to the cop. I'll call insurance. You get to work. That's all you wanted. You don't want to deal with all that, especially if it's someone you trust to do it. That's all your dog wants, direction. Make you feel like they don't have to do everything. So when you start taking charge of that situation, and then on that note, there is no such thing as alpha mentality. There's no such thing as being the alpha of your dog. Your dog is not a wolf. They don't look at it like that. They look at you like family. As I explained before with children, patriarch and matriarch, you are part of their family. They look at you the same way they would someone they trust. When a wolf in a wolf pack is leaning over food and growling over this meat, it's not so that they're the king and they can eat it all. It's because they want to make sure there's enough for everyone else to go around. They're making sure that they're looking for the patriarch and the matriarch. Same way you look at your parents, same way kids look at you. It's to give them direction to help them feel safe, secure, and tell them what to do next. It's not about being in charge and overbearing over your dog. It's about them trusting you and making good decisions. So when I say setting a standard, sir, when I say setting a standard, that's what I mean. It's making them feel safe, making them feel secure. Are you done? Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Disengaging. Let's talk about disengaging. Disengaging is when your dog's hyperfixating, honed in on something, and they disengage. I want you to mark and reward that behavior as well. Your dog gets excited when someone walks in. Oh my gosh. Mary Jane's like, Mom, did you see that person? They walked. It's so cool. But eventually she's going to go, Yes, reward. Same thing. She sees a person walking up to her. Oh my God, mom, I'm going to jump on that person. What do you think? Yes, reward. Check-ins and disengages are very, very important. Getting your dog to disengage and walk away is so important. So if we see those moments where our dog does disengage from something that we don't want them to engage with, arresto momentum, we want to reward that behavior. My dog hasn't worked in a few months. They're with us. <laughs> He's still a dog as well. He's not a special magic animal. Repeating commands. Let's talk about that. <laughs> it's an eye roll. How many times have we been in the vet office and we've heard sit, max, sit, max, 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 sit, sit, sit. And it goes on for entirely too long. Sit, 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 max, 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 sit. And at some point you're like, hi, it's okay, it's fine. We don't have to repeat commands. I promise. I promise they heard you the first time. I promise they did. Whether they chose to do it the first time is entirely different. You watched me ask him to lay down a minute ago, and it took him 10 seconds. My dog runs on Internet Explorer, while everyone else's dog runs on Firefox. It's okay. 
Sometimes it takes them a minute to compute for those thoughts to get to their brain and tell their bodies what to do. It really depends on your dog. If you have a dog with a really high drive, they might do it immediately. If you have a dog that's a really high drive and they're a golden retriever, they may do it in 10 years. If you have a Rottweiler, leave them a message. We'll get there, right? So, it's important to be patient, to slow down a little bit, and go sit and count to 30 in your head. Sit and wait. They can go over here and, they... and watch. They'll look at you. They know you have the cookie. They know what you asked them to do. But eventually they're going to go, dang it, and they're going to sit down. And you're going to go, yes, and you're going to reward. Next time it's going to get faster. And faster and faster. The more that you practice with it, but you don't have to say it repeatedly. Because the command isn't sit, 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 and their names are not max, 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 max. Say it once. Get their attention. Say the name. Start with the name. Say the name. Say the command. Honey, sit. Yes. Name, command, get their attention, right? And give them a second to compute it. I'm a bad dog trainer. I'm supposed to have my treat pouch on me. But it's heavy. Yes. So, slow down a little bit. It's okay. And it, all words are made up. I think I've made that pretty clear. It doesn't matter what you tell your dog to do as long as you tell them what it means. So if you say pineapple and that's the word you want for lay down, then so be it. And if I say arrest momentum and it means lay down, then so be it. I've taught him that's what it means. All words are made up. They don't matter. On that subject, there's a term in dog training in the behavioral world called learned irrelevance. Learned irrelevance is when an animal has heard a command repeatedly and there's been no reward presented. I wager a guess there's a few dogs in here that has learned irrelevance with one command and one command only. Come here, because they've heard it a million times because we say it for everything. Come here, stop. Come here, what are you, come here, stop it. Dog's barking in the back, come here, quit. Come here, get over here, stop it. And we say it over and over and over again. And then you're going to tell me, my dog won't come to me. Yeah, well, we can change the word. So if we already use come and our dog doesn't come frequently, let's give him a new word. It doesn't have to be come. My dog's word is Right? So you can call and say whatever it is you want to get him to come to you. But let's give him a new word if they don't come to you right now. Keep it in your back pocket. We'll talk more about that in class. But set that, keep that in your mind. Now, not using no. I am not a hippie helicopter person that doesn't believe in the word no. I just, it doesn't mean anything to your dog if you haven't actually taught them what it means. And oftentimes we catch ourselves saying no over and over and over again. And we, we don't tell them what we want. I'll give you an example. If I said, hey, did you guys help me go outside and get something out of my car? And you guys went, yeah, sure. And you walked out there with full certainty and you put your hand on a car. And I went, no. You go, okay. And you walk over and you put your hand on another car. And I went, no. How long until you're frustrated with me? Which one is it, Salem? Let's face it, we all know which one's mine. All the Nerf guns on the top and the spiders all over, that's mine, yes. But besides the point, if I just told you what I wanted in the first place, had a man, I was in the first floor apartment, man outside my window, two o'clock in the morning, walking his dog. All I hear is no, 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 no. At this point, I'm ready to get up, get dressed, go out there and be like, I don't even know what you want. Is it a leave it? Is it a go potty? Do your business? Tell your dog what you want. Makes it a little bit easier. Again, dogs don't have a finite amount of words. If you, you really mean leave it, you really mean sit, you really mean drop it, you really mean come here. It's not, no, 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 no. Getting out of the habit of saying that and telling our dog what I want, it's going to get a lot easier. And in my experience of teaching classes for the better part of the past 10 years, been a dog trainer for about 15, a lot of people, they just say no and they hope it sticks. So I say it over and over and over again. And they, they do classes and they say, well, it didn't work. I walked away from a class, I took classes, and my dog didn't learn anything from it. And so we didn't really learn how to apply it as the situation. We didn't learn how to apply the training that we got in training to real-life situations. Because we learned how to sit, 
We learned how to down. We learned how to stay. But the trainer didn't say, every time you walk that door, have them sit and then say free to go through the door. They didn't say, every time company walks in, put them on place so the company can walk in and say free so they can get up. They didn't say that when my dog is eating something, to say, leave it, uh uh, drop it, come here. So we get caught going, no, quit, cut, no. We want to tell our dogs what exactly it is that we want. Now, you're still allowed to use no, but again, we're going to teach what leave it means. Leave it means disengage, walk away, you can't have it. Leave it means that's not for you, and we're going to teach them actively that that's what that means. So that way, that can be your champion word. Now, let's talk about cooperative care. Talk about cooperative care and scheduled feedings. Cooperative care is something that the training industry calls training that we do for our dogs that helps vet offices and groomers and boarding facilities and things that you've already probably done with your puppy or your dog. Touching their ears, touching their feet, getting them used to being handled especially if you have a longer-haired dog that needs grooming or you have a very big dog that may be trouble restraining when they're in the vet office. Getting our dogs used to certain things. We'll go over cooperative care, and we're going to talk about and teach how to engage with that because the first thing that you're going to do in the CGC is someone's going to walk up and go, can I pet your dog and can I run a brush over your dog? And if your dog doesn't like to be brushed, then they're not going to do so well in the CGC. they got to be okay with being handled. they got to be okay with having something run over them like a brush, not a car. <laughs> she gave me a look, guys. It's okay. She went, oh, <laughs> something like a brush run over them, right? Oh, my gosh. That's honey. I, you know, mood, right? Straight up. I'm just going to go lay over there with her, and we're just going to hang out. So cooperative care is very important, and we don't realize how important it is until you try yourself to do your dog's nails or you try yourself to cut their hair, and they're the whole time. You want to be able to have that moment where you can ask for them for their foot. Oh, man, thank you for being so polite. Such a gentleman. Make a vow. And the longer you can hold your dog's foot, the more rewards you're going to give them. Yes, good boy. So, teaching our dogs hold their feet. Reward, reward, reward. Teaching dogs that brushes are okay, going over their body. Teaching your dogs to be held close to their body. Believe it or not, usually I tell with puppy owners, big dogs, having them used to being picked up. Now, I know that Honey got picked up a lot when she was a baby. So nowadays, if someone wanted to do it, they have to bench press something. He'd probably tackle it. He'd try. He's like, I could do it. <laughs> so, but having your dog used to being handled, picked up, held off the ground, rolled onto their back, these are some of the things that we don't think of as dog owners that vet offices really want us to practice and work with on our dogs because their life would be easier, and it would be a lot easier for you going to the vet, getting your dog used to doing that, especially if we have a long-haired dog, holding them by their chin for grooming, hold, open their ears up, touching around their tails, things like cooperative care. It's very important, and we will be addressing that as well in the classes. And last but not least, let's talk about scheduled feeding. Some people leave bowls of foods out for their dog, and they let their dogs graze as they want it, as they're hungry for it. There's nothing really wrong with it, except some dogs can't self-regulate, and so they get fatter and fatter and fatter. Some dogs, they lose the interest for training, because if I said, stick your hand in a bucket of cockroaches, and you are Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, you would go, I will pay you to not have to do that. Because if you have this food supply off to the side, why would I do that? I don't need that money. I have all the money I can think of. I'm Jeffrey Bezos. I buy yachts for fun, right? Why would I do that? No, I'm not going to stick my hand in that. I'll pay you not have to do it. As a matter of fact, I will pay you to take it out of that and burn it. So if we withhold some of those resources and set them on a schedule, they'll be more likely to perform certain tasks for us because it'll be more worth it to them and food will be of higher value. So you can still leave the food out, but I would strongly recommend scheduling feeding. And so when I say that, I mean taking the food, put it on the floor, 30 minutes. Let's say you feed your dog twice a day, put it on the floor for 30 minutes. Your dog doesn't eat, you're going to pick it up, you're going to dump it back in the bag, you're going to put it in the fridge, wherever. And then dinner time comes out, same amount of food is going to come out, and you're going to put it on the floor and offer it to your dog. 
assuming no one here is diabetic, your dogs are okay, they will eat it when they're hungry, but we can start getting them on a schedule to start eating that food when we are asking them to do so. Some of us may have chow hounds, and that's okay. I know I have one. Hand feeding helps in that situation too. Slows them down a little bit, and you can use their kibble as practice. Low value reward. Practice doing something with a whole bag of food, because some people go, I don't want to give my dog a ton of treats. It's going to upset the digestive system, pancreatitis is real, um, have these other issues. You can still take all of their food, open your treat pouch, and dump a whole bowl of food, or whatever their amount of food is, that's going to A, hold you accountable to practice training that evening, because they got to eat. And B, it's going to make it so now food and all good things come from you, and they're a little bit more in tune with you, and they're working more with you. Oh, I'm tired too. <laughs> all right, does anyone have any questions? All right, so as far as everything goes, everyone can join class. I would say she's fine. She did good. She definitely did good. And yeah, so everyone's good for class. Um, I'm going to walk up to Hazel, see if she jumps on me. <gasps> oh, my gosh. Hazel. Oh, my gosh. Cool. We work on jumping week one, so love lesson one. And if that's all I do is walk up and back and forth to her a thousand million times to work on her jumping, we can do that. I'd recommend definitely starting with level one for you guys as well because we've never done it before and it just gives us an opportunity to do something. Honey. I know. I know. Hey. Sit. Thank you, ma'am. She's not even looking at you anymore. She's like, my friend, I just met. I just met you and I love you. And she does a little bit of a squirmy thing, but... Hey, Jane, I know I've pet you in group. Are you cool with some people petting you when your mom's holding you? Oh, just be baby. So, oh, my goodness. I think it would be really good for her, too, to get the exposure. All right, you guys. So then what we would do is we're going to meet on Tuesdays at the same time and do classes. Like I said, this is just an orientation to get you guys started with your homework get you all fixed up for everything that you need. If no one has any questions, I can slowly start filtering you guys out. All right, we're gonna start with Honey first, and I'll always let you guys go out one at a time and call you kind of by name, just because everyone's gonna be safe. Not every dog wants another dog up in their face and walking up to them, so we're just gonna kind of take our time as we're going by. <laughs> 